Well, welcome everyone to Sunday's message. About a month ago, we celebrated Easter, and it was an unusual Easter because lockdown had started, and we weren't able to come out of our homes and gather together like we usually do and what we've usually done for most of our lives. It was a bit different. And at that time, I saw two cartoons that depicted and sized up for me some of the issues and the situation that we're in at the moment. And I'd like to show them to you. The first one depicts what life might have been like if COVID-19 was around in Jesus' time. Have a look. Yeah. <laughs> and the second one depicts what God's authoritative response might have been. So I guess Jesus is clearly a, a key worker. So here we have a clash of authorities. And this clash stems from the ways of the spirit conflicting with the ways of man. Peter once said something like, don't even think about it to Jesus once in Mark 8. And Jesus' response was interesting. He said, get behind me, Satan. For you have in your mind the things of man and not the things of God. Today we'll be looking at the victorious life and death of Stephen from Acts 7.54 through to the first verse of chapter 8. This further shows the contrasts between the ways of the spirit and the ways of men. So let's have a look at the passage. Starting from Acts 7, verse 54. Now, when they had heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Well, let me introduce you to Stephen. The early church is actually still being formed when we meet Stephen in Acts Chapter 6. He is recognized as a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, and he's appointed to help look after the widows in the church. He also preaches and does great miracles and signs amongst the people. Some from the synagogues disputed with him, but they could not withstand him because he was full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. So they stir up the people the elders and the scholars, and they see Stephen and they bring him before the council, the Sanhedrin, which is the same uh, uh, body that Jesus had faced only a few months earlier. And they set up false witnesses and they accused him of blasphemy. Acts 6.15 describes Stephen's countenance as he stands in this court trial, listening as the charges are read out to him. And it says this, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now you know that an angel is a heavenly being who stands in the presence of God. And this gives you an idea that a bit of that glory that comes from being with God was actually upon Stephen. But the, the word angel is also a messenger. And Stephen shows that he is a powerful messenger of God because he shows that he understands the truth of the scriptures better than his accusers do and he turns the tables on them 
and he delivers a divine charge against them. Let's read what he accused them of in Acts 7, 51 to 53. He says this, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Well, this then sets up another clash, doesn't it, of authorities. As we walk through this passage about the stoning of Stephen, I want to point out four points of contrast between the ways of the Spirit and the ways of men. There are undoubtedly many more for you to discover, so have a listen as we walk through and see what we can find. Starting then from verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So here we can see a bit of a contrast between the fruits of the Spirit and of the Spirit of man. Stephen, it says, was full of the Holy Spirit. His face shone like that of an angel. He saw God. That sounds like a citizen of heaven to me. His accusers, in stark contrast, were full of rage and gnashed their teeth at the sound of truth. That sounds like a citizen of hell. Have a listen to what Luke says in chapter 13, 28. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves cast out. Fits of anger, enmity and rivalries are fruits of the flesh. The mob demonstrated these are plenty, but self-control, peace and faithfulness are fruits of the Spirit and were characteristic of Stephen. Being full of the Spirit meant that Stephen was led by the nature of the Holy Spirit, and he shows this fruit in abundance. So you can see the contrast of the fruits. Let's have a look at the next couple of verses. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. There's a contrast here between spiritual insight and spiritual blindness. Stephen, who is a true saint, has heaven opened to him and he receives revelation of Jesus' majesty, just like Isaiah did when the heavens opened to him and he was ushered into the throne. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The scribes and Pharisees, on the other hand, are blind to all of it. Their limited minds can't understand the scriptures. They would not recognize Jesus as the Christ. And so they executed him. And now they see Stephen not as a saint, but as a sinner. And have murder in their hearts again, not purity. They do not see God. The truth is they don't want to see and they don't want to hear, just like in Isaiah. Matthew 15, 14 says, Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Spiritual insight, spiritual blindness. Let's have a look at the next verse. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Witnesses are contrasted 
here and in this passage, really. Stephen, of course, was a witness of God's glory. And he testified to the truth of who and what he saw. But in contrast, the witnesses mentioned here are explicitly identified as false witnesses a few verses earlier in Acts 6.13. Now, witnesses are supposed to be used to establish and validate truth by reporting what they saw. And the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Truth. However, the other witnesses, they are of a different spirit. They see what they want to see. They are quick not only to become false witnesses in this mock trial, but also the executioners, as we see here, taking off their coats, ready to have at it. They distorted, manipulated, abused the law, which in itself was meant to be a witness testifying about Jesus. We are called to be witnesses in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. By the way, the Greek word for witness is martyrs, from which we get the word martyr. We're not all called, of course, to be martyrs. But we are all called to pick up our cross and die daily to ourself. Let's continue on. From verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. There's a contrast here between true faithfulness and really false religion. The faithfulness of Stephen contrasts sharply with the young Pharisee Saul. Stephen was willing to die for his faith, but Saul was willing to kill for his, as we read here, that he approved of the execution. And a few verses down in Acts 8.3, we read that through brute human force, Saul was ravaging the church entering house after house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And further down in Acts chapter 9, Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Well, compare this to Stephen, who with his dying breath does not call judgment upon his enemies, but mercy. Saul himself may have become Paul because of Stephen's intercession here, that the sin be not held against him. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. See, Stephen was a true follower of Christ, following in his master's footsteps, proclaiming the truth about the way to God and accepting the same treatment Jesus had. He also was cast out from the city and murdered. Stephen also showed that he had the mind of Christ by interceding and echoing the Lord's words from the cross, receive my spirit. Do not hold this sin against them. Both Stephen and Jesus had stood before the same Sanhedrin and both testified to the Son of Man being at the right hand of God. And you can look that up in Mark 14, 62. Stephen's ministry through the Holy Spirit, not brute force, was characterized by looking after widows, preaching the gospel, and performing miracles and signs. True faithfulness versus false religion. Let's have a look at the last part of the last verse. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In the same vein, today, the church is facing an ever-growing wave of persecution. Most of us are aware of the persecution in China, where the church is restricted and controlled by the state, and pastors disappear 
or are sent to prison for years. But did you know that in August last year, a Christian was ar arrested for praying quietly near an abortion clinic just down the road here in London. And during this current lockdown in March, the mayor of New York threatened to shut down churches permanently if they met for worship in contravention of government practice. And in Mississippi, just before Easter, a pastor was fined when a church service was being performed while members stayed social distancing in their cars in their church car park. Several police cars actually came and raided the car park and members who refused to leave were also fined $500 each. Government authorities in Germany have permitted churches to reopen, but singing during worship is banned. And some authorities have also banned communion. We may well have to deal with similar clashes of authority in our own day, just as the early church did in theirs. In this passage that we've read, we've seen how the Jewish council yet again overstepped their authority by trying and executing an innocent man. There are different spheres of authority established by God which must respect each other's boundaries. And Jesus laid a guiding principle for us to follow in Luke 20, 25, when he said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Here's the key. By following the ways of the Spirit, as we've seen, rather than the ways of men, we will be able to navigate the tricky waters ahead. The ultimate reality of the persecution against Stephen is actually the complete opposite of what first impressions might give you. And this is in keeping with the ways of the Spirit, which is described in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person does not accept the things of God because they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, it looks like Stephen is outnumbered and abandoned and alone. He is not. The three persons of the triune God, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, are with him. And Jesus is standing, ready to take action. Stephen is in the majority in a position of overwhelming strength. It looks like Stephen is on trial for his life. He is not. He has already been acquitted by a higher court and now is actually prosecuting the cause of the king. In fact, Stephen has the assurance of everlasting life. His accusers are the ones actually before the divine court and already had the stench of eternal death upon them. It looks like Stephen's life has been pointless and has only made things worse for the church. But in reality, as a result of the persecution that comes, the gospel spreads out beyond Jerusalem and into the Gentile world. And poignantly, Stephen's life powerfully impacts Saul and helps propel him to become Paul, the apostle to these very same Gentiles. Stephen in many ways foreshadows who Saul would become, a man who testified that Jesus was the Christ from the scriptures, who forcefully and fearlessly confronted unbelievers, who was full of the Holy Spirit, who saw visions of heaven and who was faithful even unto death. It looks like Stephen is crushed and cursed with no reward for his faithfulness. But the reality is that Jesus was seen standing ready to receive him into his reward. Stephen's faithfulness has been written down into the word of God as an everlasting testimony and a model of faithfulness to us all. Stephen was a model to Paul, 
and Paul continued his legacy and produced much fruit. And Paul himself writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25, about receiving a crown that is incorruptible from Christ as a reward for faithfulness. And Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Now the Greek word that Paul himself wrote in this passage, wreath, is the word Greek in Greek, Stephanus. His very name, Stephen is the Greek word for crown or wreath, and by extension, reward and honour. So in conclusion, we know that walking in the spirit is the way of life and walking in the flesh and in the ways, in the ways of man is the path of death. But here we've seen some insights as to why that is so and how it works out. And in Romans 8, 4 to 11, Paul exhorts us to walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Stephen's life and death was not a defeat, but a resounding victory of the ways of the spirit over the ways of men. Not only does the spirit provide wisdom and power to overcome our own sinful nature, but the spirit also conquers our fears and permits us to even defeat the sting of death and it is all because of the Lord Jesus Christ who knew without him we could do nothing and so he gave us everything and so all praise and honor and glory and power be to his name. Amen.